Welcome to the second panel of the Young uh, Bled Forum. Uh, my name is Maya Dragovic and I am the business editor of the Slovenia Times, which is a magazine in English in, published in Slovenia. Um, the panel that you will be listening to now, uh, we will try and address a few um, aspects of the future, as in what awaits us in the future and what are the obstacles that we, uh, we will have to overcome and what we are seeing now that will affect us. Uh, in the next decades. Uh, some of these things that we will address is the intergenerational dialogue, obviously, the, uh, how do we connect the young generations with the, with the older ones. And uh, also we're going to talk about, obviously, inevitably, about the communication technology and how it has impacted uh, the way we live on every aspect. Uh, and inevitably as well, the power of the media, uh, the role of the media, um, around the world and um, again then we have to look at uh, you know what's happening in the economical sense especially nowadays when we're facing all these um, crises and how the terms of the trade agreements are changing and evolving and finally you know we, we're also going to look at in the example of China um, you know the, the power of culture and uh, how it influences uh, policy in a sense. And with me to talk about these things, I have um, to talk about the intergenerational dialogue, uh, Mr. Žiga Vapotic. He is a program director of the Zavod Ypsilon in Slovenia and he's also the author of uh, his own book, which is called My Own Book. <laughs> and um, and uh, I also have um, Ms. Uh, Eva Basaric. She's an associate at uh, Babic and Partners Law Firm. And uh, she has also uh, participated in the Willem Sevis uh, International Commercial Arbitration Moot, for which she also won an honorable mention as an individual speaker. And she is from Croatia. Um, and then also joining us from China, uh, Mr. Bao Jie. Uh, he's a teacher of Slovene language at the uh, Beijing Foreign uh, Studies University. And he's also editing the first Slovene textbook for Chinese students. Um, and. Uh, over there, joining us also from the UK is Mr. Ben Judah. He is a policy fellow at the European Council on Foreign Affairs, Foreign Relations, I beg your pardon, um, from the UK. And he's also, he's reported uh, from Russia and from uh, all over the ex-Soviet uh, Union uh, region uh, for, you know, uh, media like Reuters and uh, Financial Times. And he will tell us all about the power of the media. Um, and finally, Mr. Lenard Kucic. He's an IT expert. He's a journalist at Dello, and he covers uh, information, to, uh, information to communication technology. And uh, he's one of the few experts on post-socialist um, media uh, market. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. So, can, we st can I start with you, Mr. Vapotic? Uh, there is obviously a, a, a big discussion uh, about connecting intergenerational. Uh, differences, if you like. So can you, can you just tell us a little bit about Because yeah. you've done a lot of work on that so as well. So. But I will start with belief that we are probably in the middle of the largest revolution. We can call it also evolution of a mankind. And the development of new technology, I would say, has led to entirely new operating rules of the society. And if we look at just a few trends that describe today's society, we can see that we are really in the middle of a huge tsunami of the change. So these changes are coming faster and faster. And today, world is quite different from that 20 years ago. And I really believe that in five years, we will live totally different than we live today. And we should follow new rules of life and face new challenges. And we are developing from information society towards the creative society with lightning speed. And I'm sure that my colleague Ben and Leonard will talk more about the technology. And I'll try just to focus on three different, but let's say connected, connected teams that will, in my opinion, definitely represent the power of the future. Mm -hmm. And first of all is talented <coughs> individuals. I do believe that talented individuals are mobile monopoles with global passports. And the first major characteristic of creative society is that each and every individual actually holds a key to his own success, wealth, 
power and happiness if we want. And in the creative society, the power and resources definitely they leverage from earth, manual work and capital to the intellect and brains to the level of innovation and creativity which I would say leads to distinguished and successful competitiveness on the market irrespectively of branch or area of activity. And that is why I would say that extremely talented and competent individuals are becoming crucial nowadays. Um, we are probably talking about the less than 1% of the society, but these are people whose names are actually becoming the brands. So owning an amazing degree of freedom and ability to influence the development of the world, uh, these individuals are the drivers of change in the creative society. And if we go on with the second topic, I would mention social responsibility. Because I do, I do believe that greater freedom means greater responsibility, not only for one own the life, but also for the society as a whole. Because the individual's quality of life has become heavily dependent upon the quality of all our lives. And in the near future, mankind will face challenges as major as never before. Global warming, aging population, growing gap between rich and poor, definitely unsustainable health care, pension system, uh, and definitely also the number of people living in extreme poverty and so on. So these are only a few modern challenges to which no one has a simple answer, although we all know that they should be solved yesterday. So, and society as a whole, but these are also issue, I would say, for young people, generation Y, and we will or shall face sooner or later. Otherwise, it's quite a question whether we will still have a place to live. And if I touch the last point, I, I do believe that we are actually moving from competition to cooperation. Because the most important part of the raising the level of awareness is that understanding that we are somehow all connected in one way or the another. And one's higher standard at one part of the world does not mean any harm to some other man at the other end of the planet. So all of us should be concerned that more than, for example, three billion people are living in poverty. And definitely whether our children will have place to live not depends on the level of awareness of those who cr create the society. So therefore, I think it's essential that we arise from competition and explanation of resources to creation and participation. And that means, from where you begin, the cooperation among representatives of Generation Y, but I would say as well as intergeneration cooperation. And this one is even more important since I, I strongly believe that a joint wisdom and a healthy ambition definitely led to a better tomorrow. So breaking the ice, I would say that the first step and action are on the shoulder of young people, Generation Y, according also to the saying that the world stands on young people. But definitely my question at the end is, um, is going to be Generation Y strong enough to handle the future? And uh, what do you think? Is it going to be strong enough to handle the future? And can I also ask you, how has the, you know, the, uh, you mentioned at the end as well, uh, what we uh, said, uh, we're going to talk about the intergenerational uh, connection and dialogue. Uh, how has this intergenerational dialogue shifted? You know, we talked about it before as well. Yeah. Uh, can you just, how has it changed from how it was, say, uh, 40 years ago? I wouldn't say it's better or worse. It, I will leave it for discussion later on, but okay. definitely uh, it changed and the technology has changed intergeneration cooperation because we changed one paradigm, which is obvious. Normally it was young people asking the question, how does it work? Uh, what is this? How we came to the moon? And now we came to the society and to the position where older people are asking the question, what is Facebook, uh, how email is working, and so on. So I would say that technology really changed the society in this paradigm that only, older, uh, only young people can actually learn from older people, 
And I would say that probably now the intergeneration cooperation, it's much more fair because it's two ways process. It's not only older people uh, teaching young people, but it's also vice versa. Okay, uh, I'll leave it to that, but we will uh, get back to it. I just want to connect in terms of the communication technology. Uh, Mr. Kucic, could you just tell us, because all the known media now is uh, joined onto one platform, the internet, and um, what changes have been brought about by the convergence of the communication uh, and media industries? Well, the first conclusion is really tempting. Everything is different and everything has changed. Because uh, if you look at the media landscape today, you can say that, um, I don't know, first, the audience. You don't have mass media for mass audience anymore. Um, audience are becoming more active and media are trying to target every single individual if possible. Um, that also means a different business model. You don't sell mass audience to mass advertisers, but you try to find other ways of funding the, produ the production of media content. Then, of course, there is a big change in delivery. Uh, television does not no longer means a TV set. Uh, a newspaper no longer means a printed paper because you have all the content from different brands. You can watch a newspaper brand online, you can watch the videos, you can read the articles on the internet, on your mobile devices. Um, legislation also changed because it's different to regulate the internet as compared to the normal media. Uh, especially television, because you don't have the frequencies to assign, you don't have only a limited number of media companies that can operate on a single TV market or radio market. Uh, and of course you have a different economics of today's media companies, because in network economy you need different approaches to the market. Uh, the um, scale is even more important than before. And uh, funny as it may seem, uh, it's easier to found a media company. It's easy to start and write a blog. It's easy to start a podcast and videocast or whatever. But in reality, um, changes are not as big as it seems because still a minority of big players are dominating most of the platforms. Uh, what I try to do is um, make people think of, you know, what has changed and what hasn't changed. Uh, and uh, one of the things with technology is that we, we know their potential. Uh, the potential looks great. We have uh, this big story of modernity and technological change and think that, you know, our society progresses like this, that more progress is better, more and technology is transformative. But in reality, um, what we tend to do is that we take this potential for granted. Uh, we say it's potential and we treat it as facts, as uh, potentials catch the headlines. We hear that there is a new initiative by the, some parliament who tried to crowdsource how to solve political problems but we don't know how it ends up. We don't know. Uh, we know that the revolution started on Twitter in Iran, but again, we don't know what happens, I don't know, six months later. We see that children are all using the technologies, that they're using mobile phones and they're all on Facebook. But what we don't see is that they're not competent in using them anymore as a normal TV, I don't know, viewer was 20 years ago, because still, uh, do they know what the platform does? Do they know what the device does? Do you know how the Facebook works? Do you know the models behind it? Or are you just using this platform for whatever it's meant? Because I can just make here, a, for example, um, it's, it's a bit hard to explain, but um, have you ever thought of a Facebook uh, in a way that some guy from a big advertising agency you know, just knocks at your door and gives you a 30-page detailed survey. Oh, come on, just, you know, fill in the 30 pages about what you do, who are your friends, what you're thinking, what you're doing, and then just give it back to me. You would not do it. But 
when you're in Facebook or in most such platforms, that's exactly what you're doing. But again, it's usually not a private issue. So I think that we should start treating technology again as tools, as something that can be used with a good purpose or it can also reinforce the social powers that also existed before the new technologies. We cannot think that the new technology, if we just you know, install new technology in a certain society, everything will be different. No, some things will be reinforced, some things will change, and I think that that's sort of a starting point how to start seeing media. Just, a, again, a, another um, example of how this um, facts differ from reality is uh, blogs and social media were seen as the new big thing in media. It will empower people, uh, you could get more information, the news will happen. Only a few huge quantitative, uh, quantitative analysis has been made on what's actually going on on the web. From all the user generated content, less than 10% of all content could be very broadly classified as news or information. Then again, 90% of that 10% are only reposts and brief comments on the content that's being produced by the major media companies. Less than 10% out of 10%, meaning around 1% of content on the internet is original content that's been released you know, by the empowering creative individuals or visible crowds or whatever. And the audience for this 1% of 1% is again tiny because most of the things that actually happen on the internet only have impact if it's picked up by the traditional media, reinforced to, to different platforms, and if it reaches somebody <coughs> in the society that can actually do with this information something, either civil society or a government. Or actually, I, that's, uh, I, I just want to interfere here because I think uh, Mr. Judah should join us here because you have spent quite a, quite a bit of time in Russia, reporting from Russia and also recently in, in Tunisia. That's it, yeah. Yes. And so can you, can you just explain, uh, you know, there was a lot of media coverage talking about the, you know, the Twitter revolutions or whatever you sure. like, social, uh, the power of the social media. So can you, can you just tell us what, what your experience of that was? Well, and this, compare, please. this spring I found myself in Tunis and uh, in the celebrations to mark the end of a successful revolution. And uh, as I kind of went through the crowds into the Kasbah where the revolution's key events had taken place, I saw a graffiti that I found particularly interesting, which was, the freedom virus is being downloaded. And this made me ask myself a question, is, is the internet a wave which is going to sweep away and undermine authoritarian states? Or is the internet something that's going to do different things in different societies? What we've seen over the past 10 years is that most, society, most authoritarian states did not follow China in building a great firewall. They made a fatal error of judgment. In Russia and in Tunisia, at the beginning of the decade, less than 5% of people had the internet. It was believed by Putin and Ben Ali that it would remain an elite phenomenon of rich people, a few students and corporations that would do it in the privacy of their own home, that it wouldn't become a mass thing. They were wrong. Today, 50% of Russians are online and over 35% of Tunisians. The internet is a huge part of both societies. The question that I asked myself several months later when I spent the summer in Moscow is, why is it that Russia, which is the most socially media addicted society in the world, with global, global dominating uh, internet companies within its own region, with highly successful web portals, why has the internet not dented Putin's authoritarianism in the way that it did such disruption for Ben Ali's? This is when I started to think about the dual nature of the internet. The internet, as we all know in this room, can be a source of activism or a source of escapism. For every website uh, coordinating social activists like Avaz, there are a thousand websites dedicated to funny pictures of cats. This made me wonder, what is different about the social composition of Tunisia and the social composition of Russia? In Tunisia, you had a young society, a young society 
a median age in the 20s, a very cohesive group of youth that felt they had nothing to lose and also nothing to gain by the continuing situation. Whereas in Russia, you have an incredibly fragmented, splintered society, lots of losers, but also lots of winners, great fear and mistrust between different social classes, that means that you can't have that critical point which, in which the internet can help you bring people together. In fact, in, in Russia, the internet helps drive people apart by creating special groups, linking uh, other sexual interests one to the other, allowing people to buy products from the West, uh, travel abroad and live half a virtual life that allows them to escape from the, the problems of their own societies. Looking at Tunisia and Egypt and where you have the right demographics for a Twitter revolution, let me to wonder where in the rest of the world do we see that? Where is the next wave? I find that in West Africa, and in Central Asia, you have societies that haven't gone through internet, in internetization yet. You have internet penetration rates that are about 5 to 10 percent, authoritarian regimes that haven't taken any precautions, elderly leaders that uh, aren't really attuned to the new era, and this big youth bulge that can take advantage of it. So I think that sort of policymakers should pay attention to uh, the internet in Uzbekistan or in uh, Kazakhstan in the next few years. But what about Europe? What about the West? In fact, here I see the same trends of escapism in which European society, like Russian society, is increasingly splintered. Elites know more about other elites than they do about their own peoples. You have politics and media revolving around conferences like we're enjoying now, global multinational corporations. And I find that the internet is helping to link specific sectors to the other and you have societies that are too multipolar to allow that, uh, that critical mass to come through on, uh, tw on Twitter or Facebook for young activists to take advantage of. But uh, wouldn't you say also, uh, I think uh, Mr. Medvedev, he's also using Twitter to communicate to his people. So there is the other side. The, the, the elites are, if you want to call them elites, they are using the modern sure. uh, ways of communication but to talk to their people. Well, in, in Russia, you find that Medvedev has kind of embraced uh, social media. Not everyone in the Russian government does. You have a lot of the kind of elderly, more kgb oriented people who are very against it. But Medvedev, Medvedev feels confident that Russian society is fragmented enough for him to indulge in social media. Medvedev mm -hmm. plays the role of the kind of perfect son-in-law to the Russian middle classes. Mm -hmm. He's on Twitter, he's online, he has an iPad, whereas Putin plays a role to the Russian working class and uh, the sort of the hard-up Russian man in the street mm -hmm. as a man who has no time for Twitter or Facebook, mm -hmm. who prefers hunting. And I think that the Putin-Medvedev relationship towards the internet captures a lot of how splintered societies aren't at risk of, a, of Twitter waves of activism in the way that more cohesive young societies in the Africa or the Middle East are. So would you say, uh, Mr. Vafovic, I can also include you here, this is a, a kind of a typical example of uh, generational conflict, if you like. And would you say that, you know, that there is a, a resistance to, just to go on a broader s uh, scale here, a resistance to, of older people to uh, endorse what actually affects our lives nowadays in terms of new um, gadgets, if you like. Yeah, my question often is, do I really dream about the society when my grandmother will read newspaper on iPad and follow our president on Twitter? Uh, because, you know, but the gap between the knowledge, and I agree with Leonard, he's saying it's about understanding the tools, is really big. And when I talk with my grandmother, she's often saying that we are creating discriminatory society. Mm -hmm. And that's why she's more eager and eager to get more information also about the tools. Because if we look just the commercial on TV, it's so often they're written more on www. But my grandmother, she doesn't understand this language. Mm -hmm. And if we just look at statistics in Slovenia, there is over 90% of people over 65 who never touched the internet. And we created now a quite big project called Symbioza in Slovenia, where young people would like to show advantages of computer tools to older people. 
And in October, we will probably get about 10,000 people to get information about the new technologies. But here, we would really like actively show intergeneration cooperation, because we talk about intergeneration cooperation a lot. Mm -hmm. But our question was, what can young people really do? And, but still, we can here open a topic about is it good and does technology has only advantages of, for older people. Mm -hmm. And I would be really afraid of the, of the time when um, I will have my grandmother on Facebook and not going to her for lunch. Because I would say, you know, she can follow me on Facebook. She can saw that I was last week on, in, uh, in Ireland and she can saw a picture there. So she's informed enough about that I'm alive and what's going on with me, and I would skip a lunch with my grandmother, which is a fascinating event nowadays. Personal touch is still very important. And, and it would be also quite interesting to see how, how the culture influenced this, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, is it something that uh, this society will accept and the generation which is coming after us and will use internet also for relationship? Mm -hmm. Is it the same, for example, from my friend from China. Do they see uh, the same intergeneration cooperation and how the culture influences it in sense of the importance of family and these scenarios? Okay, Mr. G, I think, I think you should actually uh, uh, respond to that. Yeah, I just pick up this topic like uh, to introduce some basic situation in China. I would not like to say very something in general, just take my family ex example. I mean, the, family rule for Asian families, especially in China, is very strict. For example, you should learn something from your parent, but your parents are not going to ask you something. But actually, this situation is changing. For example, my dad has an iPhone, and I also have an iPhone, so we FaceTime to talk. But how can I teach him that he should register an email first and active an iPod ID? and then link them together to active, that is complicated. But he did it with my help. So the society is changing, and I just want to take the topic, the culture. So the culture is everywhere in our society, and even for like a higher level. For example, I'd like to say culture is the soft weapon for all the countries nowadays, not only like the UK or France or Italy, America, the big states, but also the developing country like China. For example, I would not like to say from a political point of view, because I'm from the academic field, so how Chinese government used the culture as a soft weapon. I'd like to give two examples. One is the Chinese Confucius Institute. The function of it is like the British Council, it's like the French Culture Institute or the Italian Culture Institute. We established this kind of institute all over the world in order to spread the culture and in order to encourage people to know more about China, not only the Chinese language, but also the history, the society, and how people communicate, and something, etc. And another point of view of my example is myself. For example, I'm the teacher of Slovene language at Beijing Foreign Studies University. And Slovene people may say, wow, why you teach our language? But it is quite normal to hear in Slovenia, what do you study? Chinese study, wow, you have a, br uh, have a bright future. But why? We know less thing we can get from this Slovenia language and culture is major, but we still are doing that. And we not only have the Slovene, we do also have Estonian, Lithuanian, Latvia. Maybe my mom has never heard about that countries. But we're still doing that because we want to build up a new, life, a new level of communication. This kind of cultural communication is not to avoid the attention of communism, of ideology, but to let us understand each other and let us to keep in touch with each other. In this case, we can know more and we can develop together. So related with culture, I want to say two things. When we deal with culture, I want to say culture can never be isolated. We have lots of kinds of culture in the world, and we, and we should give them enough respect. And the second, we should not use like one country's culture as the standard. For example, what I met in Slovenia, my friend asked me, oh dear, have you ever heard about Chuck Norris? Oh, 
come on, I haven't heard about Chuck Norris. Oh, how come you haven't heard about Chuck Norris? But why I should hear about Chuck Norris? If I don't know Chuck Norris, does it mean I'm out? No. Take another example. If you have never listened to Mozart, people will say you don't know music. But have you heard about the Butterfly Lovers? It's a Chinese traditional music. Oh no, come on, why should I know it? But why we use the double standard to charge the world, especially the culture field? This is not good at all. This is kind of optical for us. So that is my point of view. And for culture, and we, all, we can also take this point of view to the economical field or globalization. And I think my colleagues can also talk something about that. Okay, I think uh, Mr. Judah would like to comment. Um, I'd, I'd like to ask you a question, which is, do you think Chinese soft power is shackled by the Chinese government's censorship and uh, persecution of artists like Ai Weiwei? Uh, do you think this is limiting China's capacity to express itself and the way Chinese culture's capacity to, to engage with the world? Actually, I always face this kind of question, and the first thing I want to say is that I, rec I represent myself, I represent my job, but I don't represent my government. I don't represent the Communist Party in China, but I represent Chinese people and Chinese culture. This is something isolated and separate we should see. For example, I'm trying my best to learn Slovene, to the language and the culture, and try to meet my friends, to show them my culture, but I cannot prevent what my government is doing. But I know there is something not like uh, suitable for this progress, but I think the situation will be changed in the future. Thank you. Okay, I'll, I'll just ask you, uh, just to kind of, uh, so there are two um, aspects to uh, promoting <coughs> culture, Chinese culture. One is, in a sense, to break those, that, that part, um, perception of uh, um, China as uh, a communist country or all these uh, perceptions that we might have about it. And the other one is to, to allow other people to actually get to know the culture and uh, spread the influence in a sense. Is that, am I getting it right? Uh, I always want to get rid of the political views. For example, we have the uh, Confucius Institution and we never say at the beginning, hello, we are going to have a communism uh, <laughs> festival. We are going to say we are going to have a Chinese traditional festival, but not communism or capitalism festival. Mm -hmm. This is something really, really isolated and separated. So okay. I want to say we are promoting the culture just with our uh, own strength, but we are not promoting the government. We are not promoting that. Okay, before I move on to questions from the audience, I'd just like, uh, Ms. Basilic also, uh, we have to touch upon the uh, trade agreements, especially in the current uh, global situation of, as I said, you know, the economic crisis and the changing, the ever-changing uh, uh, nature of trade agreements. And since you're a corporate lawyer, I think you're well-placed to tell us a little bit about that. And then, you know, I'll move on to if you have any questions uh, from, the, uh, from, well, from yourselves. <laughs> Well, yeah, I just wanted to briefly touch upon uh, the issue of economic globalization and uh, the differences between the worldwide uh, institutions uh, uh, versus the regional institutions and regionalization uh, of the trade. Uh, I mean, for, for many years now, we've seen uh, globalization of trade, opening of free markets, even in the, starting from the the past century and uh, what derived uh, from from such a globalization and liberalization of, of the market was uh, a great difference between the, the highly developed countries and uh, the poor or underdeveloped, less developed countries where the um, big rich countries were actually dictating all well, not all, but a lot of the, the terms of the, the trade. And one of the answers uh, to, to such a position that's actually um, sort of a, a growing trend is definitely the regionalization uh, of trade, which can be done through either through institutions or um, actually extra institutional, just through cooperation within um, companies and uh, sort of going out into the world as a particular region with um, a plan and an idea for the region to prosper. 
Um, basically, uh, I think the one of the problems that uh, happened here was that a lot of uh, smaller, undeveloped countries, when they were jumping into this free market process, uh, that's literally what they did. They jumped in. They, they were not maybe well uh, prepared. Uh, they did not have enough educated people uh, to, to follow the process, to, to implement uh, the, the more liberalized market uh, in their own countries, which is probably one of the reasons why they sort of were left behind and in this entire process in and in in trade regimes they they sort of took the the back seat and just went along with the the terms of the trade imposed by uh, the the richer and more developed countries and um in that sense, the, the, the regionalization uh, of trade uh, would actually be sort of a, a benefit uh, because it would allow access to, to larger markets, you know, maybe as a couple of countries going out as a united front, um, opening up uh, and, um, of course, adopting new technologies and opening towards uh, foreign investments more and actually attracting foreign uh, investments into their um, into their countries so basically just um, a way for the less developed countries to compete more successfully on on the world uh, market okay but um, there is there, there well there are a few issues but one that I would like to raise is the fact that you know, we have regional trade agreements, but then we have all the, you know, the EU is one big trade agreement. True. And then within the EU, we have now the Union of the Mediterranean. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, then we have the endless negotiations between the EU and Russia. However, that's uh, quite, that, that's taken a long time because there are different interests within the EU. So how can this be overcome and what are, you know, how, how can we overcome the different interests that are, that we are facing and... Well, I mean, in, in, in my opinion, it's always the question of bargaining power. Who, mm. who has the bigger bargaining power, like the bigger leverage in, in the entire story? Obviously, that's going to be the, the party who will benefit. It mm. doesn't necessarily, I mean, sometimes small countries can have uh, certain resources that uh, are um, um, quite required by some of the, the bigger developed countries, then th that, that would definitely be their plus in the entire situation, their way of um, negotiating better terms uh, mm -hmm. for them in all these agreements. But I mean, it's, it's still the story about um, who, who has the bigger bargaining power. And unfortunately, it, I mean, usually, it, it's just the way of the things that it's the it's the ones that are the more developed and, and richer um, associations or countries. And it's, uh, in terms of bargaining power, it doesn't always necessarily mean that the, the, the stronger will actually get. No, no, yeah, of course not. The example is uh, also the benefit of a small country, exactly. like Serbia, that's, the free trade agreement it has with Russia. It's attracting a lot of... That's true, yeah, exactly. And as, as I... Um, as I s referred to before, I mean, it's it, there is a chance for for smaller countries to to gain uh, benefits uh, due to their own resources. Mm -hmm. But um, I think in in that opinion, it's not only ju just about what the country has to offer, but also the the mentality and how prepared the people in that country are to, um, I would say follow or actually negotiate something for themselves. So either how uh, well educated they are, how uh, informed they are, how prepared they are to, to take the sleep and actually fight for, for their country's um, role in, in the global okay. market. Okay, uh, at this point, is there anybody from the audience that would like to pose a question to any of our panelists? I have to be shy. No? Okay. Um, well, well, I have loads of questions for you. Um, actually, uh, Mr. Judah, uh, you could, I could uh, bring you in here as well in terms sure. of uh, EU-Russia relationship in a sense. 
Do you course. think it's ever possible to have that sort of EU Russia? Well, in Russia, in the Russian Foreign Ministry, playing divide and rule in Europe is a bit of a national sport, and pitting one European country and its special interests in oil, gas, tourism, uh, investments has enabled Moscow to prevent a consolidated European position. China is doing exactly the same thing, and in some ways more effectively. And this is a trend that's going to advance a lot in the future. We've got a, we've got a deepening problem in Europe uh, in terms of our authoritarian capitalist friends uh, playing divide and rule because of austerity. The austerity situation in southern Europe means that these countries can't afford a foreign policy that places a business second. The, this situation is being made worse by the fact that in, uh, in Northern Europe and especially in Germany, there's a lack of solidarity on economic issues and on Euro issues, which is seeping into the rest of the EU-Russia relationship and is making consensus on what is not a first-rank priority for Europe right now more difficult to achieve. Mm -hmm. well, how do you, just for both of you, how do you think this, uh, the, the shifting of uh, power, if you like, from the United States to uh, BRIC countries and uh, Turkey and Indonesia, uh, how is that going to affect the future? Uh, policies, in, in not just economic sense, but in cultural sense as well. Um, yeah, and, and now we, yeah. after the world financial crisis, and we're going to see the world can be more colorful, and the world cannot be only one voice. I don't mean like the, f the, the only one voice is correct or not, but I mean more colorful voice, the world can be more better. So I'm quite confirmed that the world will be not like who will be the superpower or super leader of the world, but we are going to cooperate and we are going to build up and we are going to develop together. Now we can say uh, China is the largest developing country and contributes to the world uh, GDP the most, but I'm still thinking if the world is only one voice, that is impossible because we have to follow the one rule. But if we can cooperate, I think that's quite in quite possible and doable and we must use this way. The thing we have to do is to be more tolerant to the difference of culture, difference of policy, difference of anything and respect each other enough and then in, in this way I think it's, it's doable and I, I believe there's a bright future. <laughs> I'd just like to jump back in there which is um, it's, it's become very fashionable to talk about talk about BRICS. It's very fashionable to ask what Turkey thinks and to ask what Indonesia is capable of. But one thing that we're ignoring is that uh, Europe has a very serious political crisis. But that if Europe can overcome that political crisis, and this is much an appeal to our generation of Europeans and anything else, Europe is the largest economy, larger than the US, larger than China. Europe does more trade with China than the US. China buys more European technology than it buys US technology. Europe's infrastructure is in a better shape. Europe has a bigger military budget than Russia. And Europe has a lot of potential to be a force in the 21st century. What we need in Europe is to break our cycle of enfeeblement. And the cycle of enfeeblement is that we don't have an agreement between debtor nations and creditor nations, between sort of uh, the Northern Europeans and the Southern Europeans. We don't have agreement in foreign policy of whether or not we should focus on Eastern Europe and the Balkans, or whether we should focus on North Africa and uh, the Middle East. And we also are, are lacking leadership and we're lacking vision in Brussels and in the national capitals. And we need to begin a debate as young Europeans, it's like what the reinvention of Europe 
needs to look like and what needs to be done. And the thing that alarms me is that our possibility to be that free in the G3 and to prevent the return of uh, Chinese and American, or to prevent the return of bipolarity in the form of uh, China and America, is that we don't have that courage, we don't have that courage yet. And uh, I think the key reason that that's not happening is that we have a, a technocratic populist spiral. We have, uh, we need more EU integration. In order to get more EU integration, the technocrats don't go and do it secretly, behind closed doors, which means it has no legitimacy. They do this because they're terrified of populism. Uh, what happens is they create more populism in return. So I think to break that, we need to have a really frank conversation, and it's a conversation that uh, I think young Europeans need to need to engage in and uh, have a real chance to, to change the debate in a positive way. Uh, anybody would like to come in now? Yes, the gent uh, No, you're just looking. Okay, you got the mic. <laughs> no? Okay. Oh, okay. Katya. <laughs> Can I have the mic here? Thanks. Um, hi, Katja Gershak. I uh, work for an NGO here in Slovenia. We uh, actually work in Uzbekistan on human rights issues, uh, just to give a bit of background. But um, thank you, Ben. This is very, uh, I'm happy to hear an opinion like thank that. You. Uh, because I hold the same opinion and I think Europe has always had a problem in projecting its power mm -hmm. even though we're the ones that give a lot of aid out to other countries yes. uh, monetary wise we give a lot but we never could actually project that power out and I definitely agree with you that's all I want to say thank you well just to kind of follow up, follow up on that is that why yeah. does Europe not have a uh, what, why is Europe for instance in aid not having the impact and I think it's that Europe in its foreign policy it's just not very political Europe behaves a bit like a large development agency. Europe's mm -hmm. not conditional with Russia. Europe's not conditional with China. Beautiful Beijing airport, built on money from the European in Investment Fund. And uh, Europe's not quite worked out that strategic culture of trade-offs that Americans, Israelis, Iranians, Russians are so good at. And I think that's something that we need to focus on as uh, the next generation. To <laughs> okay. Uh, yes, gentlemen, here at the front. At the front. Hello. Um, I would just like to ask, do you think the solution is in more supranationalism within Europe? or Because it's quite difficult to have a, a tough opinion on anything or a, or, a, or a stance while you have so many different interests. I mean, or maybe even varying degrees of the same interests. You have to be very bland in, in, uh, in sort of what you're saying as a common European foreign policy. I mean, do you think the, the solution is in m a, a more supernatural, uh, national uh, approach? Sorry, where are you from? Could would you mind Serbia, just stating? Serbia. Serbia. I'm from Serbia. My name is Ivan Weber. Okay. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I, you're asking kind of two different questions there in terms of like supranationalism. I think that we have to just accept that the dream of one-speed Europe is over and that we need to embrace two-speed Europe. And uh, we need to embrace a messy continent in which we will have France and Britain leading on the military, we'll have Germany and uh, the North and France leading on the economy. And I think that we need, to, we need to work more towards that. And trying to fit everyone in the same framework hasn't worked and we need to be open with that. It's not necessarily catastrophic. I think in terms of developing a common European foreign policy that, that isn't bland, I think we need to learn how to trade. It's quite interesting that they're the same amount of countries that don't, uh, that don't recognize Kosovo, you have the same amount of countries that don't recognize Cuba. I think that that's, for instance, an example of where, of where we need to learn how to have an engagement. And uh, in terms of uh, how to make Europe, the European elite more more capable of exerting its power in, in foreign affairs. I think that Europe has been, to a certain extent, infantilized by, by its reliance on American power. Something I found extremely disappointing in a recent research trip to Moscow was that um, European, the European presence there was very willing to say, oh, we don't need to do security. America does security, we can concentrate on business. That's not going to be that's not going to be Europe 2020. And America's got its hands full in Asia and in Iran, in the Middle East, 
America's sense of decline is deepening, as anyone who's read a 9-11 op-ed <laughs> can, yeah. can say. And uh, we, need to step up to the, we need to step up to the challenge. Okay. And I think a lot of that is getting a new generation in power. Is there, sorry, but before you ask the question, is there anybody else that would like to respond to this on the panel? No? Okay. Yes, please can you just state your name and where you're from as well. Hi, I'm Dafina Buche. I'm from Kosovo. Uh, I was listening to the entire discussion and I want to go back a bit to the, what the panelists, panelists talked about, especially on the issue of the power of internet nowadays and the future of the young, con year, the small countries. All the debate was focused on like big countries, China, Russia, UK, US, but what is going to happen to the small countries? And what is the media? Is the media um, sort of bringing a real realistic view of how these countries, what, what the life in these countries is? From my personal experience, is when you go to Asia and you tell them I'm from Kosovo, they look at you like, oh, okay, because they have no idea where you're from. Or the other, the other side is you go to Europe and you t tell them I'm from Kosovo, they go like, wow, you know, the war and everything. Mm -hmm. And to my opinion, that is not a realistic view of the life on these countries, especially on, on the small countries. So my question here is, what will happen to the small countries in the future? And is the media doing a good job on presenting the, uh, a good image or the realistic life of the life uh, of these countries? Thank you. Are you talking about the media in general or are you talking about the new media, the internet? Both of them. Both of them. Okay, and this is for who would, uh, I think quite a few of you can answer some aspects of this uh, question. Leonard, yes. Uh, would well, you like I, to go first? I can try. Um, from the 1980s on, uh, most media companies um, cut, I think, more than 90% of all foreign correspondents. Now a single foreign correspondent can cover North Africa or Middle East or Southeast Asia. Um, so um, no, uh, it's the easiest answer to your question. Um, small countries are not being covered. They're being, not being represented. They're only being covered if something happens there. Something bad, <laughs> pretty much. <laughs> And uh, you could see a very interesting thing when the so-called internet revolution starts in Tunisia and in Egypt and stuff. Big media <coughs> knew nothing about it. Then things started on Twitters and on Facebooks. Then the big networks were starting you know, picking up the news from YouTube. They were, um, they were airing the YouTube reels and they were covering the situation by following the Twitter feeds. Only after a week when it became obvious that something bad is happening there, I mean bad enough for a good media coverage, they would start sending their teams there. Uh, the first correspondents from, I don't know, Tel Aviv would maybe come to uh, Tripolis or whatever and they would contact the same people who would tweet and blog and post YouTube videos there, who could speak English, who were fluent, who were media savvy, who knew how to contact and how to talk with journalists. So even if you say that now when the cameras, the camera crews came there and all the buzz of social media uh, covered there and uh, when the uh, old media met new and the citizen journalists were covering stuff from the streets and the big media were covering that with their camera crews, could you say that it was a good representation of what happened there? Or was it a mixture of what the West wants to see there? to speak with young people who talk about democracy, who share the same values, wear the same brands? Or would they you know, take time to discover Egypt and go somewhere outside Cairo and maybe find somebody who could say something about how people live there? And uh, what does it mean for a member of an upper middle class? What does it mean for a university student? What does it mean for a 60-year-old? What does it mean for a child from the street? You don't have such coverage. 
And sorry, you won't have such a coverage. Okay, uh, Mr. Judah. Um, well, I think that the internet has its own geopolitics. And just to, to answer your question, in the 1990s, uh, a country could uh, declare independence, it could set up a TV channel broadcasting its own language, it could uh, create national newspapers which would be funded in its own language, and that the media would then enhance sovereignty. Something that's quite alarming, and you see this in the post-Soviet space, is that now with the internet, that's actually undermining sovereignty. People in Central Asia are, are having to brush up on their Russian. There isn't enough online, in Kyrgyz, in Uzbek, and there won't be because it's not commercially viable. And it's quite interesting that you can see around Russia uh, a kind of runette internet hegemony appearing. In the Middle East, there you've seen certain dominant, uh, fiscally dominant Arab countries like Qatar use Al Jazeera to dominate the media playing field. And I think that trend's going to increase. So I don't think it's a particularly positive story for small countries. There's another aspect to internet geopolitics, which you see in Africa and in Central Asia, which is um, a lot of these authoritarian states want to control the internet, but they don't necessarily know how, which means that this gives an avenue of opening to China, because China knows how to do that. And, uh, I think we need to ask ourselves as Europeans, uh, what should, how do we fit into this? Can Europe uh, develop a set of internet tools to burst firewalls? Should we be doing that? Can we host uh, opposition websites and civil society platforms from denial of service attacks in the West? Can we give, can we secure websites? And I think that controlling the media, sp controlling those IP functions will be an important kind of source of power in the, the 21st century. I don't know if that's quite answered your question, but... Um, okay, uh, Mr. Babu, you would like to comment yeah, on I'll, that I'll just yeah, because, touch the Kosovo, because I was there a month ago, and I have to say that I was shocked, being from Slovenia, about the great development of Kosovo. And in the whole Balkan region, you can see very strong influence of family, which is good, uh, if I touch my topic of intergeneration cooperation. And I would like to say that I believe, but I would say I hope that the new generation would be much more faster able to solve the problem. And I would believe that young people from Kosovo and young people from Serbia would solve the pro political problem that exists much more faster than the current political people, how they do it. And that's why in my dream society, uh, the intergenerational cooperation is involved everywhere. Uh, I do believe that the best boards of companies, they, they are built with people that are from 25 to 30, at least one member, and you have a member who is 65 to 80. And I do believe I would run away from the country where the prime minister is younger than, I don't know, 40. But I would always bet to have at least one minister in the government who is from 25 to 30. So, and if I just answer your question about the small countries coming from Slovenia, obviously not the biggest one, but I, I do believe that we can survive, but we need to understand the added value that we have and the advantages that we have. So, and we need to create the whole innovation society much more than the bigger countries. Okay, Leonard, as well, you want to say something? I'll just go back to this idea of uh, new information geopolitics. I'll just give you two simple examples. Two years ago, uh, a large part of Asia was cut off the internet for a couple of days. Uh, soon it became obvious that it was a technical error because a ship that was somewhere near Alexandria did something with the something and she cut and the ship cut the optical cable that connected that part of Asia, one optical cable. The question was, why Alexandria? Um, I was a part of a project at that time and we did a very interesting experiment. We tried to find the, um, the whole network of electric cable from the early 19th century, no, early 20th century. 
And then we did a map, see where the telegraph lines went, and then we tried a new map with the optical lines. And we saw that the maps are practically identical. That our telegraph runs along the same corridors as fiber optics. Um, which again has something to do with the colonial past of how the telegraph actually emerged. And also the cables today are operated by pretty much the same companies or the ancestors of the company uh, that uh, run the cables. So it's still physical. Uh, and you have 13 servers over the world who host and direct all the internet traffic and the servers have their own physical location. You have the agency in the states who assign all the internet names, etc. All the internet basically is also physical. It's not something abstract. Another example. In January, uh, an Icelandic MP, I think it was Brigitte Jonas Dutir, was informed by <coughs> Twitter that a federal court in the states um, wanted all her uh, wanted access to all her Twitter information, including her own, the emails, um, the personal communication, all the public tweets, everything, because she was one of the associates of Julian Assange uh, when they released the famous Baghdad tape with the helicopter and the shooting <laughs> of people. Uh, she asked the Parliament. Can you protect me? I don't want to give my personal data to the American court. I'm here, I'm an MP and I'm a European citizen. I'm not accused of anything. Why would they have access to the information? It turned out that the whole European Union and their MP members and the diplomatic struggles of Iceland and protest, they wouldn't stop Twitter to give all the information to the court because Twitter is an American company it hosts the information on American soil, they have to comply to American uh, rules. rules. That means, bottom line, that all your Twitters and Gmails and Facebook profiles and whatever, actually, they follow the American rules. You're not protected and nobody in the EU can protect you against that. And there are many examples. I can go on and go on and go on how this geopolitics still matters. So, sorry. Uh, and so technology is not good in a way. We no, reveal no, too I'm much. Saying, but we, we just shouldn't idealize it because we have the same question now with new media as we had at the end of 70s when there was, in the United Nations, there was a huge debate on the information monopoly. Uh, especially the third world, so-called, they uh, opened this discussion. Well, uh, American content is flowing us uh, through networks, through satellite. Well, can we do something about you know, this? Can we regulate it? Can we do some quotas or introduce some barriers or whatever? And of course, it never went through the UN. Never. Uh, okay. Um, just to jump in quickly there on kind of small states. And uh, I think there is a future for small states. I think there is, uh, there, I think that small kind of, small Balkan countries need to learn from, learn, with what, learn to do in the EU what uh, Scandinavian countries do globally. And Scandinavian countries specialized. They send their best and brightest to the UN. Mm -hmm. They learn the WTO, WTO mm -hmm. like the back of their hands. They put huge amounts of investment into becoming world beaters in NGOs, in multilateral institutions. And within those institutions, which are incredibly important, they uh, have a voice far bigger than their size because they know them best. And I think that within uh, the EU, I think that... Uh, Kosovo, when it becomes an EU member, and Serbia and uh, Slovenia should follow the example of Slovakia. And I find this, I find that you have a very high representation of Slovaks in Brussels. They prioritise Brussels. They know how it works. Mm -hmm. And it's seen as the key political appointment. And in that way, big member states are aware of Slovakia. They reference it. They ask what it thinks. And a Slovakian is always in the room. And I think that that's the best strategy for a small state in the 21st century, regionally and globally. Okay. Yes, and take advantage of it that we don't have the burdens of colonial past. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I want to ask actually, just before I take any more questions, because um, we're talking about the 
um, differences in the EU uh, policies, the differences between you know, the good and bad of information technology and stuff. There's also another aspect here that we uh, are facing. You know, we have the uh, old world or the Western world, which is quite developed. And it's, you know, we, we, uh, to put it kind of visually, we have a situation where we're going from cars to bicycles. Yeah, and then we have uh, an evolving superpower, uh, which is essentially moving the other way around. And in the meantime, we are all trying to create these common policies in how to protect the global environment. How, how is that going to work? And, you know, is it a good uh, way to go forward to have one policy for uh, differently developed? This is the same thing as, you know, in, in, in a yeah. different way, but the same thing like within the EU. How, how do you create a policy for all when you have such different, and it's also do the small countries and big countries, you have such different interests, such different uh, goals, and you're trying to create something, you know, you're trying to follow the same rules. Is that, can that work? You know, or should we be looking at other options? Um, actually, I want to say it is a quite a sad topic. I think currently it is not doable and it is impossible. For example, lots of small countries, they only see, they, look, they only focus on the current situation and they go with the, those countries from which they can take benefit, they can take profits. Today they can be the member of the European Union, next day they can join with America. In this way, they have, they have not a very clear identification of themselves. And on this base, the cooperation is very difficult. But how we are going to lead all of these like smaller country and undeveloped country, not by one superpower, but like take some like um, more 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 justified, more more reasonable rules. But I, I, even nowadays, I don't know how this can be worked. But I believe we can. I'm not going to say China will represent all the developing country in the future. This is impossible, and I don't want to see this because I believe we should develop together, and we are leading our future together. Mm -hmm. And the benefit is <laughs> is a tough question. Okay, would anybody else like to? Uh, yeah, well, I think that on the environment and on those global issues, the Copenhagen model failed because it assumed that only states were actors and it assumed that you could create one size that fits all. States aren't the, aren't the only actors and one size can't fit all. What we need to do now is we need to embrace, embrace say, a messy world, lots of uh, overlapping regional, sub regional, corporate to corporate uh, connections and regulations. And we also need to uh, try and go for what's been called a diplomatic in, uh, industrial complex. We need to try and tie together NGOs, governments, corporate tycoons to multiply that power that cuts through the rhetoric of certain states or that are hostile to environmental change, to find the constituencies within China, within the US, that will work for us. And uh, I think that that's a far better model that doesn't irritate people, that doesn't kind of prickle national sensibilities, and I think it's one that the EU would be very good at. Okay. Uh, we have a question from a gentleman in the second row. Just state your name Thank and you. where yeah. you're from. Thank uh, you. I'm Bardilas and Papa. I'm from Kosovo as well. Uh, uh, we are earlier in the panel for the Western Balkans together with my friend from Belgrade, and uh, we were exploring the possibilities of how we can better cooperate regionally. And we know that media, especially the modern media, the internet, is one of the best tools, uh, you know, to establish networks and to cooperate um, uh, uh, between uh, peoples of different uh, uh, backgrounds and from different states. And I see, uh, I wanted, the question that I would want to, to ask to all the panelists would be like, what is the threat of, of the media in the future? Let's take the example of WikiLeaks, for example, and, and the, the uh, precautions that, that, that the other panelist was saying for the, for the Gmail and the others. What if, uh, uh, what, how do you see this threat of the secret information that we consider that uh, is properly handled in, in the modern media might be a threat for the future in creating a, a, a sort of hesitation to the uh, if not to the general public, at least to those that are operating at, at the decision-making uh, levels to exchange these information uh, through, through the modern, uh, modern media. Is this a threat uh, for the future that would sort of uh, 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 
be, be an impact obstacle to a, grid, to a yeah. quicker and better communication mm -hmm. uh, between the decision uh, makers in, 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 in the region. I took the example of, of uh, Western Balkans, but this relates to, 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 to uh, all other yeah. regions as well. Thank okay, you. Okay, Leonard, would you like to uh, start with this? And I, I think I think Ben will probably have something to say. So. <laughs> well, I can give you another two examples. <laughs> okay. Um, no, what do you think? What do you think? Will it be a threat? Do you think that we are being controlled too much by, you know, uh, revealing all all this information that we are giving out on the internet? Do you think it's a threat to the society in the future? I think that am I correct? Am I understanding the question correctly? Yeah, it's a potential threat, and it's. Uh, but I mean, is it a real threat? <coughs> it's a real threat, considering the power relations in the economy and media and politics. I mean, it's a bit powerful too. It's the same as asking, you know, is, uh, I don't know, is, is our weapons for mass destruction a threat? Yeah. So you're talking about the state level? Okay. <laughs> they can be, if you use them mm -hmm. in a bad way. No, 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 I know. I'm okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, ben, would you like to? Sure. I think that 20 years ago you had a more democratic media. You could be a CEO, you could be a prime minister, or you could be a well-informed member of the public and you would read the FT and The Economist, and that would be where the information was coming from. I think today we is, we're moving towards a world where there are the info poor and the info rich. If you work in a corporation, or in a think tank, or in a news agency, you have privately commissioned studies coming in from every angle. You have private polling. You have more information than you can deal with. You want to know about uh, voting patterns and consumer tendencies in southwestern Kosovo? You pay for it, it's there. Mm -hmm. So we're moving towards a world where there are people who have all the information at their disposal and who know everything, and people who know nothing. Because traditional media, those newspapers that we know and love and grew up reading, are being gutted by the collapse of foreign journalism, sure. the collapse of them being viable. And this is something I'm very frightened of, because I think we're moving into a world in which the gap in knowledge and in lifestyles between the middle classes and, or, and the, the working classes of, in Europe and the elites are getting bigger. And I think that that's something that we, we need to work out how to re-democratize that information. And uh, I think that's going to be a very big problem for us over the next 10 years. Plus we need skills. Because uh, yeah. there's been a lot of debate on this initiative <laughs> on open government, you know, free the data. Uh, Wikileaks is just one example, you know, just put everything online and then make, but well, people will eventually find interesting information and make some sense of it. And a lot of government agencies in the States, in the EU, are releasing huge amounts of data. Um, but what they're forgetting is first that we as humans are not machines. We do not, well, well maybe programmers and uh, data miners, they would consider themselves to be pretty competent in how to use the data and see what's in there and make some sense of it. But most people don't have the skill, don't have the time, they don't have the resources to actually make anything out of such data flow. That's the one thing. Okay. Uh, Katya. Katya would like to ask a question. Comment. If okay. I may just comment on, on Ben's thing. Um, <laughs> I, sorry. <laughs> I think already the, the gap in information already is a problem for us. Mm -hmm. um, yes. and, and we see it in Europe and the U.S., which is what ties into the whole populism thing, you know. Mm -hmm. The U.S. is the, the most established democracy in the world, has the smallest participation in the actual democracy in terms of election participation mm -hmm. and people knowing really what is going on outside their country. And and when you when you look at it, then it's really difficult to make very difficult decisions. We've, we've gotten to a point where we're overspending on we cannot afford the lifestyle that we have and now we have to make very difficult decisions in Europe and the US and now communicating that to the public is becoming very difficult because mm -hmm. it's, it's a very complex issue. So you just have to say okay well now we have to stop living the way we're living and it's going to be very difficult to accept that. So we're in Europe in particular we're sitting on a precipice and God forbid I really don't want to see uh, this generation that is sitting right here all of us uh, presiding in the future over a slow undoing of the EU because the difficult decisions are going to have to be made today. So basically what you're saying as well is that you know even though there is plenty of information it's not being used in the right way. Well yeah because look, I mean look at Europe That's right now exactly it's, the, yeah. 
it's very look look at Angela Merkel's communication or or the key countries that are sitting on money right now and that you know that that is Germany and if anybody's going to be financing the Greek crisis it's probably going to be Germany and we just have to say okay we are all going to have to step together and pull out money together if we want to save the euro and if we want further financial integration mm -hmm. and nobody wants to hear this right now mm. because you know sure. <laughs> we're <Not> all popular <laughs> yeah. okay thanks Katya is there anybody else that would like to um, ask a question. Here, the lady in the second row. Just stay where Thank you are, you. please. My name is Anna and I'm from Russia. Uh, well, I'm a teacher. Oh, interesting. <laughs> yeah, uh, first of all, uh, I'm, I'd like to say that it's great to see uh, so many young people uh, motivated and uh, caring about the uh, international cooperation and such. Um, complex and important issues. And uh, I'd like to uh, come back uh, a little bit uh, when, um, uh, well, uh, you spoke about uh, the uh, problem of uh, escapism in the internet. Uh, and uh, I would like to uh, maybe focus uh, attention and uh, probably to ask for your opinion or advice or maybe some comments on this uh, issue because uh, I'm, uh, as I already said, uh, I'm a teacher and uh, I really observe this tendency, especially among the younger generation, that uh, they uh, really sometimes prefer to live in their, uh, you know, their own uh, small comfortable world of uh, uploading uh, uh, Photographs and uh, downloading music. Uh, 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 is there anybody that would would you would you like to comment on that, Giga? I would be pessimistic here, although I'm very optimistic in my normal life. But I <laughs> I, I do think the situation will be worse and worse. And J sorry, just uh, keep it brief because yeah, yeah, we are actually running out of time. Schools. I would say that schools are important, but I would stress here family values and question how the families and parents will touch this topic and how uh, they will care with children. Mm -hmm. And it goes to communication, it goes to, to why we have children and so on. Okay, uh, um, just briefly, because uh, we really do have to finish uh, A very recent large network analysis has shown that we did a big mistake when we tried to you know, visualize the internet as a network. Uh, we used to, uh, sort of like it works like in our neurons in our brains when everything is interconnected. The truth is that it's formed like a soap, like bubbles. Uh, it's not neurons connected, but they're bubbles touching. So most of the communication is done within a bubble, and almost there is some communication on the edges of the bubble, and almost no communication between the bubbles. That's mm. I think it's a very important thing to understand how this. Communication okay. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, we are out of time. I just have enough time for uh, each one of our speakers to make a closing statement. And Ms. Pasaric, I would like to make the <laughs> first closing statement because we haven't heard much from you. Uh, uh, yeah, thank so you. Basically, um, what, in line with what we've uh, discussed here, uh, the position from the, the trade point of view should not be pessimistic for, for small countries at all. As long as small countries take uh, matters into their own hands, negotiate good terms for them, So, but not only terms that will have like um, very instant success and instant flow, okay, but also time. yeah, something they could benefit from in years and decades to come. So really, when negotiating the terms, it should not just be about instantly getting rich and losing all that money within a year or two, but really worrying about the future and next generations and uh, accumulating wealth and trading in, in that respect that the country can actually blossom for years to come. Okay, uh, so equally briefly please, uh, Giga. Yeah, I will try to answer back my question, is going to be Generation Y strong enough to handle okay. the future? And um, I will use a quote from Ramsey Clark, which is the nation which does not respect older people is forgetting from where it came and where it goes. But I will definitely, at the end, bet on the, that the power of the future is in cooperation. Yes, in intergeneration cooperation, but also in cooperation in general. Mm -hmm. We need to understand the power of cooperation for a better human future and a set for the power of the futures. Okay, thank you. Ben? I think that uh, there is such a pervasive and asphyxiating sense of confusion in 
the West today that it's impossible to speak about it. And I think that over the next few years, uh, there needs to be a reinvention of, uh, and a re-questioning, and a rethinking of the political compass. And I don't think that's happened, and I think that's part of the problem. I think we need to go back to principles and ask like, what state-society relationship should look like, what kind of setup do we want in terms of uh, in terms of the state and in terms of the in terms of the union? And I think we need to be more political. I think that people need to be more engaged. And I think that this goes as much for Russia as uh, as for the rest of Europe. And I think that that's up to our generation to do that. And something that I've remarked upon over the past couple of past few years as this crisis deepens is that people are in, is that the gap between what we say in public and what a lot of us feel in private about the health of Europe is getting wider. And I think that we need to sort of uh, we need to sort of start thinking in private to, <laughs> and not just worrying and trying to bring that out into into the open. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chia? So if we take European Union as the successful um, example of the cultural, economical, political cooperation, then I think we can enlarge this union. And all I want to say is that as an individual human being or as the individual human being who, repre who represents your own country, we should think more about what can we contribute to this world instead of what can we get from this world. For example, I'm always thinking the function of the Confucius Institute and we are telling people that we Chinese people were modest, hardworking and welcoming. So maybe this can be the core value from our nation, but what can you bring to this world? So if we just want to say to give something instead of to get something, maybe the cooperation can be more easier. But sometimes benefits is always on the first level. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Leonard, just a brief. Uh, when Barack Obama came into the office, he asked the people of the internet what should be his political priority. Uh, as the top one came legalized marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> when um, British MPs asked the same question, they learned that uh, pe the people want Jeremy Clarkson, the famous TV presenter and the lover of fast cars, to be their prime minister. <laughs> when Nick Clegg tried to crowdsource uh, the wisdom of British crowds to find the best way to uh, where can they um, cut budget spending, the people said, well, stop financing those wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Needless to say, no suggestion was taken seriously. Uh, and that's also a part of the problem why the idea and the sense of citizenship is declining and why I think that mm, what we have to do is actually to reinforce this idea of citizenship again. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, so basically, uh, the small countries need to look at the long-term uh, gains, not just short-term uh, make rich. And uh, we need to talk uh, more to our elders, and they need to talk more to us. And uh, we need to be, especially the young people, more politically involved to you know, give that power back to themselves. And uh, also we need to think about what we can contribute to this society. And then the, the idea of citizenship might be resolved as well. <laughs> um, thank you very much. My name is Maya Dragovic, uh, the editor of Slovenia Times, and uh, you were joined at the panel of looking at the power of the future. Thank you. Thank you, thank you to my panelists.